Good theories unify things we know. Theism unifies basic science and human experience better than any rival worldview. And theism centered on the person and teachings of Jesus is the most plausible form of theism going. Or so I believe. And in the next few minutes, I'll just try to gesture at why. Science is a remarkable human achievement. But science has limits, inbuilt limits. For our purposes, its most important limit is this. When it goes to the bottom of it all, science can only describe, not explain. It can only say, this is the basic structure of physical reality, and these are its dynamical principles. It must be silent on the most basic question we can ask. Why is there anything at all, anything to answer to the descriptions of basic physics? The world science seeks to describe points beyond itself and points beyond science. Further, recent physics has shown that the existence of beings like us, conscious, self-aware beings, is extraordinarily improbable. For us to be here, it appears that the world had to be more or less exactly as it is in highly detailed, fundamental respects. Naturalist atheists tend to say that our world just happens to exist, and we got lucky. But why something so elegant and so fine-tuned for beings like us? The cosmic lottery looks rigged. Again, uh, our universe points beyond itself and beyond science. It points to personhood at the heart of reality. Finally, if there's to be any hope of our knowing an infinite, transcendent God in a personal way, he must disclose himself to us. You know a person through relationship, not a theory. And as I look around at the many putative revelations from God, the only one that I find credible is the one centered on Jesus. I respect people who disagree with me, but as Aristotle said, in disagreeing with his revered teacher Plato, our greatest loyalty must be to the truth. And the truth is, Jesus is a singular person in human history. He was, or claimed to be, more than a teacher of wisdom like the Buddha. He was, or claimed to be, more than a prophet like Jeremiah or Muhammad. Jesus audaciously claimed to be very God with us. The author of life, entering into his own story as its lead character. Years ago, as I read and pondered the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels, he called to me, saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I came to trust him and to place my hope in him. Jesus tells us that at the heart of reality is a trinity, an eternal dance of love among three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bound in a mysterious, interpenetrating unity. And wonderfully, Jesus is the door. Through him, we may be healed of our brokenness and hope to be taken up together uh, into that eternal dance. I look forward to hearing my colleagues sharing how they see things and to our conversation tonight. I'm going to try and keep my remarks brief and address them initially to the question, is science enough, and give you the answer you're probably not expecting, which is no. I like art. I like music. I like riding my bike. Of course, the, the scientific uh, community is responsible for the nice welds on my titanium frame, but the actual experience of riding the bike is something that uh, I experience as a living organism. And of course, when I go home, I want to watch Breaking Bad, or Celebrity Chef, or all sorts of things other than the Discovery Channel, let's put it that way. So yes, science is not enough, but of course the question that we're really here to address is, is science enough as an explanation or understanding of why we are all here? And of course, one of the things that really matters to me, besides watching Breaking Bad, is sitting on the couch with the people I love, watching whatever show we happen to be watching, or riding bikes with my friends. 
And it seems like those kinds of experiences are the ones that are very hard for us to understand the point of them all, unless you take an approach which says, well, we are biological creatures, and we are biological creatures that have certain drives because of the history, the long history of our species and the rest of organic life on this planet. And although I'm not supposed to be responding to Tim yet, I do have to acknowledge that there is, at the end of it, a question of why something rather than nothing. And that is one of the greatest mysteries of it all. But science is able to answer all of the questions we have about the configuration of things that we find here around us, including the kinds of feelings that we have about these things. And replacing one mystery with another does not seem to me to be enough either. And so I prefer to go after the things that I can address in ways that I understand how to address, recognizing that that understanding itself expands and gives me new ways of investigating questions that were thought unanswerable before. And so I challenge anyone who says, we don't know how to explain this, that the only method they have available to them is to keep trying to explain it within the terms of science that are available to us. Many people, of course, will testify to their experience with a, a, a theological entity of some sort or other. But there are so many such conflicting testimonies that it is actually very hard to decide which one uh, to take as truth, as veritas. And only science gives us a method by which we can test these claims and check our own understanding and improve our own understanding and improve the methods for finding out more about this wonderful world that we in fact inhabit. So thank you very much. Let me just say, I'm a scientist. I love science. Uh, we do science in my lab. I'm driven by curiosity. Uh, when I was a little kid, I wanted to know how fish could do that breathing thing underwater. So we got an aquarium. I wanted to know next how birds could fly, so I started building airplanes. And now my latest thing is how do brains think. So we have a lab in the physics department. We uh, put little pieces of brain on multi-electrode arrays. We record their collective activity. Uh, I love science. I think it's a great way to describe how nature works. Um, I hope you all vote for people who increase science funding. So I'm, you know, bully for science, OK? So, but do I think science is everything? No, absolutely not. I think we're probably all going to agree on this. So let me illustrate with a little story. We had a Nobel laureate, John Mather, come to our department a while ago. And uh, he got his Nobel Prize for explaining the cosmic microwave background radiation. That's the, the echo of the Big Bang. And uh, he was giving his talk. And I went up and I asked him, uh, what do you think about the cosmological constant being just right to allow for life? And he goes, yeah. That's pretty interesting. It is just right to allow life. But do you want me to say anything more than that? If you do, it's not science. And I kind of you know, thought about his uh, prestige and everything. And I tucked my little tail back and went to my office. Wee, 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 wee. And I thought, you know, wow, I shouldn't ask questions like that. But then I thought about, wait a minute. No, no. As I sat in my office, I built my courage up. I didn't go back to talk to him. But I thought, you know, as we, <laughs> as, as we always do, we, we rehearse it. And we do better in our mental rehearsals. I thought, wait, that's a really interesting question. Why is the cosmological constant just right? And in fact, there's about 15 constants that are exactly right. How do I mean exactly right? So if, if some of these constants are even one one billionth greater or less than their actual values, we would have no life at all. It's not just that we would have two heads or we'd look green or we'd be Klingons or Ferengis or something like that. We would not exist because stars wouldn't form. Okay, This is actually not controversial. All physicists and cosmologists agree with this. This is an established fact. But now, what do you make of it? Well, ah, common sense tells me, hmm, whatever initiated the Big Bang, that thing was powerful. It stood outside of time, and it favors life. Suggests a god, but it doesn't prove a god. So I'm not in the realm of science, but should I think about this question? Yes, I should absolutely think about this question, and you should too. And I think that this is a question that everybody thinks about. All the great minds who have ever written philosophy, and maybe even physics, and anthropology, and cognitive science have thought about this question. We should all think about it. Uh, you know, This room would not be packed if we were discussing, do leprechauns exist, right? That wouldn't work, right? But does God exist? And from that, all sorts of other questions flow. How should I live my life? Do I have a purpose? All these things are deep questions that humans must grapple with. And so no, science isn't enough. I think we're all going to agree on that. But what's going to be really interesting is the contents of what we disagree on. So science, to summarize, describes things. But I think what philosophy and religion can do is they can prescribe things. They can tell us how we ought to do things. Science can never do that. 
So uh, I look forward to hearing more of the uh, discussion. Uh, very similar to Colin's perspective um, that we, we should look for material explanations for things uh, first. So I, I consider myself a materialist. I want to explore, I think scientists need to explore uh, material explanations for, uh, for the amazing phenomena that we see around us uh, before assuming uh, a god or some other kind of a, of a uh, creature that um, would be, as Colin put it, um, replacing one mystery with another. Um, so I do think, I think we all believe that uh, science is the, um, the most effective way of um, approaching the question of truth, of trying to find out what's correct. Um, so if somebody makes a claim uh, either in a book or in person or whatever that they believe uh, some aspect of the world is explained by some particular thing, um, science is really the best method that we have for adjudicating whether that's uh, the correct uh, perspective or not, whether it makes sense given other kinds of observations. And I would also say that as a sort of additionally, you know, to approach the question of um, uh, explaining some phenomena that we find magical or amazing or incredible, really as scientists we're honor bound, I think, to look for uh, material explanations, explanations that fit within the realm of, of what we can see, that we can touch and, and feel and investigate and so forth. And that we, we have to uh, assume that stance as scientists first I think that uh, my own personal beliefs are that uh, this method has worked so well for so long and so many things that seemed incredible are now understood, at, at least at some level, using this method that I don't see a reason to, to jump to the conclusion that although I don't have an explanation for why these constants are the way they are, that that, that means that I'm, I, I need to jump to the conclusion that there's, um, an, the only answer is is uh, a god or, or Jesus or, or some other creature like that. Um, so my own personal research is in uh, evolution and I'm interested in brain evolution and so forth. So another part of my sort of worldview is that so much of, of what we understand about ourselves can be framed in this context of evolution that it explains um, a huge number of, of interesting facts about humans, um, how we got to be here and so forth. Uh, and I also, another part of my perspective, um, I think that there's a, a great value in understanding or recognizing that complexity and interesting patterns can occur, uh, sort of emerge from interactions of many, many, many um, individuals and atoms and so forth. So I, I, I feel like the, the answers are probably there. And in any case, I'm comfortable with the position that right now we may not know certain things, but that doesn't mean that we need to go the next step and assume uh, some sort of higher power. How come you have the better jokes? <laughs> <laughs> Tim, did you? Yeah, so, so both uh, uh, Tom and Colin uh, made the point that, well, to appeal to God is to replace a mystery with a mystery. Uh, and I want to say that's right. God is the ultimate mystery, right? That's, that's not a hostile statement to me as a Christian. It's Christian doctrine, right? God is ineffable. He's beyond our understanding in many ways. We, 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 we just have a, a limited grasp on God's nature. Um, but what I would want to say is that look at the, the trajectory of 20th and 21st century physics, both fundamental particle physics and big space-time cosmology. Uh, theorists are saying really mysterious things about reality, but they have good reasons for doing that. They, they have models that, while we don't really understand the models in certain ways, uh, quantum mechanics uh, posits a, a, a deep, weird kind of relationality to physical, uh, the physical world that we don't really understand. There's not an agreed understanding of what it's saying, but there is agreement it's saying something that's very much on the, track, the, the path to truth. So sometimes we do that when we push up against the limits, explanation does get mysterious. The only question is, when should you do that? You don't do it gratuitously. My claim is God unifies. It unifies the, uh, our commitments about the objectivity of morality, 
right? It, it, it provides an explanation for what would otherwise be an extraordinarily improbable coincidence that our universe is fine-tuned for life. Uh, a variety of other things as well uh, that I believe that appeal to God explains. So it simplifies our conception of the world, but yes, it does posit something deeply mysterious. Right. Yeah, Colin. I mean, I would follow up by saying that we're driven to quantum mechanics by the data, sure. by the observations, by this being the best predictive theory that we have going anywhere in physics. I think physicists universally agree it's the most accurate physics, uh, theory in physics, bar none. Um, and unification is a kind of psychological need. It's not uh, an empirical virtue. It's, it's something that satisfies a desire you might have for feeling that there's some simple explanation for everything. But it's not something that we're driven to by the data. The data could be very, uh, the world can be very complicated and the, and the data can reflect those complexities. So I don't find it, um, I don't find the mere desire to be able to unify or simplify particularly moving when it comes to saying, I'm gonna settle on this particular explanation. Also respond. I, I have something to chip in, but go ahead. Maybe. Okay. okay, so I, I, I would say, thank you. I would say that uh, this idea that we were talking about, a God of the gaps, like say, you know, science explains everything, and here's a gap, and we just go, poof, God appears, and that's what he does. He fills gaps. I would say, no, that's not what cosmology has done. Cosmology started out with not even knowing that we had galaxies. Then we found out the universe was expanding. We ran the movie backwards and said there had to be a Big Bang. So that means something had to initiate the Big Bang. That thing science tells us, stands outside of time. That thing drove the whole explosion. That thing favors life. So I, I had this conversation with a theorist in my department. I said, you know, what do you think of this? He goes, yeah, that agent would be powerful. That agent would be favoring life, and that agent would be outside of time. And I'm like, yeah. You know, so what do you think that is? I, I think science actually drives you to that. That's not a god of the gaps. That's something that only recently, well, recent, within the past century, kind of popped out. And I think, it, here's what it does. It gives you the qualities of whatever that agent has to be that initiated the Big Bang. It has those qualities. And they are unified because they all came from the beginning of the Big Bang. It's not psychological. I think the data lead you there. So, so I, I'm not sure the data do lead you there. So there are cosmologists who would argue for something like a multiverse. So there's some background condition in which these bubbles pop up occasionally and th there are lots of Big Bangs. And if you have enough Big Bangs, you're gonna get one with the constant set for what we find here. So that there is one bubble somewhere with intelligent life having this conversation is not so remarkable and likely if that's the background picture. Now, of course, I don't have any evidence for that being the background and picture. would you ever, right? Well, that's a question. You, as we currently understand it, we would not ever have any. But that's where science continues to surprise us in finding ways of giving evidence for things that were once thought beyond the reach of any kind of evidence. So I'm not ready to say we'll never have evidence for that or never have good empirical reasons for it. Who knows what's around the next corner? And so I'm not prepared to jump to some intelligent agent doing it when I see there are other hypotheses out there. And particularly when just saying that there's an intelligent agent doesn't, for me in any way, suggest why that agent would want to predict, pr produce particularly this Mm -hmm. set of circumstances, mm -hmm. because there are other sets of circumstances sure. that would support life, and maybe there are other sets of circumstances that would support life that would, in general, be a lot less miserable for a lot of the intelligent beings in this particular bubble. So when I look at it, I think, what intelligent agent actually generated this? You know, what a you know, swear word inserted, right? Sure. Um, and I think this is the age-old problem that, and now we're maybe getting ahead of our program a little bit, this is the age-old problem that theists generally face, which is, why is there so much unexplainable misery in this world if you think that some nice, friendly, personal savior created it all? Well, I think we'll get to that, but I, I do want to say... To me, as a philosopher and, and as a metaphysician, no less, uh, I love multiverse theorizing, speculative stuff <clears throat> in, in cosmology. I think it's really cool. I actually happen to think, uh, this is not a widely shared view that theism actually predicts an infinity of universes. But that's a, a thought for another mm -hmm. time. Uh, but here's the thing about, as I understand it, uh, and I'll, I'll defer to John on this, uh, the, the models that we have for uh, kind of multiple universe generating primordial condition turns out to have fi uh, fine tuning at a higher level, right? It turns out not just any old 
kind of condition, primordial uh, condition, can give rise to the right sort of distribution of universes that you would have to have to do away with the surprisingness of what we observe. Turns out we get, we get fine tuning in the mathematics of that just as well, so. Well, so I would just say that, um, you know, I, there are explanations in uh, evolutionary biology about how you get amazingly designed organisms and uh, structures like the eye and so forth, uh, again, not by invoking a, a higher power or God. Or, and, and so I, I think, you know, it, it's possible that there's a, a God that made the cosmological constants the way they are and fine-tuned it the way you say, but I, I don't see that, that we are driven to that, uh, as, particularly not as a starting assumption. And I think as scientists, we have to explore these material non non, uh, I would call them magic, explanations for the, the possible phenomena. So it could be true. And then the other thing I would add is that, um, you know, there are uh, anthropologically uh, many, many different kinds of uh, religious traditions and, and cultures that, that have different kinds of viewpoints about what a God is and what, how the whole universe works. And, um, you know, which of these is, is correct? You know, I think, again, the, the scientific method is the way that we would try to adjudicate these kinds of things. And so, you know, even if there is a God, is, uh, how are we sure that it's, say, the Judeo-Christian God and not some other kind of a, of a framework? So th that's sort of my perspective on that. Can I yeah, offer sure. a question? So uh, these are great. I'd love to talk more about them, but I, I want to throw a different curveball out, which is uh, how do you know what's good and what's bad in conduct, like moral behavior? Can you get that from science for you guys? Well, I don't think you can get it from religion any more than you can get it from science. So that's, a, that's an evasive answer. But can you get it from science? Give me the direct answer. So I'll give you the direct <laughs> answer is we can get an understanding of why we have the values that we have from looking at the conditions for life, in particular the conditions for human social life. Um, and then I think we can also look at the way in which we have evolved to have a kind of reasoning process in which we accept a principle that says no distinction without a difference. And, and so we can look out at everybody in the audience here and say, you know what, I have no rational basis. I could choose to discriminate on people on, on the basis of your hair color or mm. your fingernail length or whatever it is. But there would be no rational scientific or any other kind of justification for picking that feature as a reason to cause or justify a, a difference in treatment. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you start with, a, with the idea that morality is by definition consideration of others, and that any distinction that you make between others is going to have to be justified by some difference in their characteristics, just as we think you know, you're not required to provide ed free education for your dog, right? Uh, we, that's based on a difference between the dog sure. and the students who are all here who are not getting free educations, but they are getting subsidized educations <laughs> at least, right? Yes. Uh, yes. So uh, I had a free education. I'm English. So um, <laughs> <laughs> superior. No, I, never mind. Right? Is that a joke? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I think, you know, when we start thinking about the things that we do uh, base our decisions on, and we think about also the kinds of sociality that uh, we find rewarding because of the way in which the human species has particularly evolved to live in communities and so on. I think we understand why we have the, um, uh, the, the kinds of values that we have. But wouldn't evolution also support, let's say, genocide? I mean, like, if one group wipes out another group, their genes don't get passed on. That's a viable solution in terms of evolution. Evolution will reward that. No, evolution won't necessarily reward that because any group that's capable of that kind of genocide is also capable of turning inside itself and making distinctions within itself and killing itself off. Maybe, but I mean, what happened to the Neanderthals, right? They, they might be gone because we killed them. I don't know. That's, it's possible that that happened. I mean, we did well, have the 20th century after all. Well, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right. We don't want a pr an evolutionary proof that we can't have beings like, like what. No, we no, no, but I, but, but I was challenging the assumption that, that this would necessarily be of advantage to the group that mm. did it, right? Mm -hmm. So I was pointing out that it doesn't have to be that way. There could be pressures which actually mitigate against But that. it also could be a solution that evolution allows. Like, I, I'm just saying evolution by itself 
can't get you to love your neighbor, right? It, because and, and what's an, but neither I think unless you're willing to just take the claim that anything that your theology tells you is the right thing to do, which you know going back to Plato is not being a vi thought to be a viable solution for this. Um, can, neither can that tell get you to love your neighbor. That is, you get to love your neighbor because you apply the kind of rational thought that I just gave earlier, which is to yeah. say, I have no reason for discriminating my neighbor from anybody else. There's no feature that they have, right, which, which would justify a different Sure, but that's a philosophical here. statement that isn't and can't be rooted in science alone. Well, I've already said that science can't explain everything. Right. But I did say that science can give us the means for explaining why we have what we have. So, yeah. Yeah. Th this might be a good point as we see kind of some differences in perspective for each of you to maybe just talk mm -hmm. briefly about how you came to your worldview and kind of process when that took place for you. Maybe reverse order of this? Sure, reverse sure. order, okay. Uh, yeah, so um, I guess just speaking personally, I, uh, I was raised uh, not in a uh, religious uh, tradition of any particular kind. Both my parents were, um, had attended church, but by the time we came along, um, uh, we, we weren't attending church. And my father is, a, uh, is an engineer, and uh, whenever I gave him questions about how the world worked or why things were the way they were, I always got a sort of engineering answer. You know, it's, it's put together this way because the thing twists the way it does and so forth. And, um, and so I sort of always, uh, I was always intrinsically questioning, I think. Um, I was very interested in why things were the way they were, more so than, than other kids I knew. And, and then if you combine that with sort of a lack of, of uh, uh, you know, a, uh, a church uh, environment that would supposedly give me these answers. Although I think even if I had been in that uh, kind of environment, I would have also questioned where are these truths coming from and why should I believe this book or this person. Um, and then combine that with the fact that whenever I asked a question, I got some sort of mechanical answer for how it worked. Um, that, I think, led to my uh, general perspective that I wanted to see how much could be explained in these sort of mechanical terms. Um, and then. I actually didn't have any evolution background until I got to college. Um, I went to a public school in California, but um, even in the high school, we didn't talk about evolution. Um, and when I got to college, I heard it, and I remember thinking, what? That can't be true. But it made so much sense, and it sort of burrowed itself into my psyche, um, and seems to explain so much that's so interesting to me uh, that I'm here today. So. Thanks. Uh, I grew up in a household that was nominally Christian, but uh, at one point in college, I announced to my mom that Jesus was just a philosopher and I didn't believe in him, and they didn't ground me or anything. So uh, I, it was fine. I could do whatever I wanted. They were pretty open with me, believing whatever I wanted. Uh, and then when I went to college, I looked at all sorts of different religions. I went through an atheist phase. A, I, I wouldn't say I went through a Muslim phase or Buddhist, but I read Muslim stuff, Buddhist stuff, uh, Hindu stuff, tried to settle on things. And... I was uh, haunted by this video I saw by Franco Zeffirelli of Jesus' life, and I remember seeing that when I was younger, and I thought, wow, he's a good guy. I like him. He's uh, welcoming to people. He's humble. Uh, he is uh, willing to get down on people's level. If he really was God, he came down, and he kind of like played horsey with the kids so they could all kind of climb on him and see who he was. And I thought, this is how you want to be. I, if I had a best friend, I would want someone with these qualities. This is sort of the moral pinnacle. And so I investigated that. I tried, I was very skeptical. I said, you know, are there extra biblical sources writing about Jesus? Uh, you know, how do I know the text is reliable? I looked into all those things, and to my satisfaction, I found there were answers. I thought, okay, this makes sense. And then I became open to the idea that there could be a God and that Jesus could be a son. And then I, I prayed, and things changed. I, I do see that there are, I wouldn't say there's no conflict between science and religion. I mean, the standard one that we'll probably talk about at some point is Genesis and evolution. Uh, be happy to talk about that. But I think that, you know, there's even ways to interpret that. The Bible clearly uses uh, metaphorical language at points. Jesus says he's sowing the seed, and then the disciples say, what are you talking about? And he goes, oh, that's the word of God. So he uses metaphors at points. The, the trick is, what's metaphor? What's miracle? How do you read it? 
I mean, I definitely believe in a miraculous God. Jesus resurrected. Uh, and I think that that explains uh, a lot to me, going back to sort of the unity of things. I can't get those answers from science alone, at least not to my satisfaction. So I actually grew up uh, in a fairly religious household. Um, my father was a lay preacher in the Methodist circuit. Um, my grandmother played organ twice every Sunday, once in the Wesleyan Chapel, once in the Church of England uh, in the village. Um, and I went dutifully to Sunday school for many, many years. Um, and I think it comes down in the end to the sorts of issues we were raising before, um, but also perhaps some particular experience with people who, and I'll qualify this, called themselves Christians. And I know that the standard response here is going to say, well, they didn't understand it. But when I was eight years old, uh, we were living in the Cayman Islands and there was a hurricane bearing down on the island and we were all called into the assembly hall of this uh, school that was run by Church of God. And we were asked to pray for deliverance from this hurricane. And as hurricanes do, it wobbled and went off and actually went over Cuba. So we were called in a week later to give thanks for our prayers being answered. And I remember this very clearly. The, person giving prayer saying, and thank you, Lord, for sending the hurricane to kill those godless communists. And I thought, mm. what kind of religion is mm. this? Yeah. Um, and as I thought about it more, the problem of evil became more and more apparent. And just as John may be right, that, that people can use evolution to justify things like genocide, it's compatible with evolution. It's perfectly compatible with a set of doctrinaire Christian beliefs to conduct all kinds of horrors. We have the Crusades. Uh, we have all sorts of examples of this throughout history. Um, and that just strikes me as something that the human race would be better off without. And I do think that if we can <laughs> cultivate this attitude that we are all equal on this planet, we are all on the same ride, on the same journey, with the same finite set of resources, we cannot then say, oh, well, it doesn't matter because I'm going to get an infinite payoff for doing whatever it is that I do now that fits my theological precept of, of good behavior. I would rather just justify that good behavior based on uh, terms that people can accept regardless of their theological beliefs. That just seems to me to be the more powerful position to hold. Right, so I grew up in a nominally religious home. Um, but uh, so sort, of, sort of like Tom, and uh, given that I was the sort of person that would grow up to eventually to be a philosopher, I, I was very skeptical, had lots of questions, and was very resolutely agnostic by the time I was in high school. Uh, and then I moved from agnosticism to Christian faith when I was at a stage of life that most of you are at as a college student. Um, it's very hard, I think we would all acknowledge, to, to reliably know what the, the particular psychological influences are on a big decision like that. But I can tell you three things that I know that stood out for me and that I think played an important role. Uh, one was that I befriended uh, a, a rather intellectual student who was a history major uh, and got into debates with him about the existence of God and church history sorts of issues. And this had an effect on my thinking. Uh, the second thing was that I... Um, I saw Christian community for the first time, real Christian community that was highly imperfect, but nevertheless that was deeply powerful. Uh, and that had an influence on me. Uh, but finally, the third thing was just over a period of several months, I rather intensively read through the Gospels. Uh, and over time, I came to see the world through Jesus' eyes, right? His, his, his way of understanding reality became my way of understanding reality. And I, I can't tell you when exactly that happened, but over a period of time, I, I, I embraced that conception. Um, I just want to say a couple of things, you know, and I've continued to think about this. I'm a philosopher, so I, I still think to this day, uh, question my, my own views. But a couple of things, um, comments that were made um, up till now, I, I, I fully embrace evolutionary theory. When I became a Christian at the end of my freshman year, I knew several Christians who had varying degrees of uh, misgivings about evolution, and I just thought that was ridiculous. I thought evolution is just this beautiful theory, 
beautiful, I mean, it, it unifies. That's why it's so beautiful. It unifies, it explains to us why we see the variety and distribution of species and fossils we see, why the facts of, of comparative anatomy fall out in these beautiful patterns, why similarly with genetic patterns, right? Like the, the, the famous um, evolutionary theorist, Dubshansky, famously said that uh, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Dubshansky was a Russian Orthodox Christian. Right? He saw no incompatibility. I, I've never seen any incompatibility between the two. Um, finally, uh, just about, yes, that, that a lot of uh, terrible things are sometimes done in the name of religion. Uh, I, I'm, you know, as a Christian, I'm ashamed of certain things about Christian history, but I'm also very proud of many others. I think, uh, on balance, uh, the influence of Christianity in this world has been tremendously good influence, and I could, I could talk about many, many things that were Christian ideas that we don't even think about as Christian ideas because they've permeated our thinking if you, if you grow up in, in Western culture. Um, but Christianity, we don't bar the doors, right? We don't, we don't push people out. We don't have any kind of moral checklist that you have to, to measure up to in order to become part of the Christian community, right? We accept broken people, and broken people do bad things. I do bad things. We all do. Uh, but, you know, I think a, a number of evolutionary psychologists, I'm very favorable towards interesting stuff that's going on in evolutionary psychology about the origins of moral thought and religious thought. Colin knows a lot more about this stuff than I do. Um, but uh, many evolutionary psychologists will tell you religion is a very, very powerful force. It's dangerous, but it's a very powerful force to motivate people to act collectively toward the good. I don't think we have uh, good examples of large-scale uh, deeply unreligious, uncommitted thing working out in a, in a long run. I, I think that, that's a, I mean, I can agree with Colin that I would like people to uh, just do the good, do the right thing just because they see it intrinsically as the right thing to do. But uh, the actual fact is that human beings uh, uh, in the aggregate um, are motivated much more, much better when they, when they see a vision, they see where hum humanity is headed. Right. Well, I'd like to ask a question just for Colin and um, Tim. Uh, do you have just a, a caution or two for those who have a theistic worldview? I think you need to go first. <laughs> well, uh, one of the cautions is that theological theistic communities and human communities more generally tend to form close circles and, and not be open to outside ideas, and that's one of the wonderful things about this particular opportunity is that we're, we're practicing a different kind of uh, inclusiveness here. But, but I think on the whole, many theistic groups are very close-minded about alter not only atheism, but also about alternative theologies, um, and we've seen where that leads. So I think the caution is um, to remain skeptical at all times about even the things, and Tim's already expressed that he questions things, but even the things that you think are the most obvious. The same is true in science. And, you know, we think that the Big Bang is the best explanation we have now. Maybe that'll hold up for a very long time. Maybe it mm -hmm. won't when we mm -hmm. work out what's going on with dark matter or whatever else, mm -hmm. right? So, so I think science necessarily cultivates a kind of open-mindedness. Everything is up for revision. In religion, I don't always see that everything is up for revision. Yeah. So I guess, so I'm, I'm to address uh, religious students who, who perhaps share my particular uh, religious commitment or, or more broadly have a religious commitment uh, and to uh, admonish you or express warning. So uh, <laughs> here goes. Uh, I, I think there are three things perhaps that I would like to say. Um, the first is to remind Christians that the most frequently repeated command in the entire Bible is do not be afraid, right? Uh, and I, I, it, somehow in our peculiar American context, many Christians in the last century have become very fearful when it comes to approaching the scientific investigation of the world, especially when it concerns human origins, things, things that touch on what it means to be human. Uh, but look, God, we believe, if you share my belief, we believe that God is the author of nature just as much as he's the author of the Bible. There can be no contradiction between the two. If they're, they're written by the same author, an infinitely wise author. So, um, you know, what are you afraid of? That's, that's what I want to say. Go boldly, pursue knowledge. 
And related to that, I want to say that your, your intellect, your mind, is a gift from God. So you have a, a motivation that your non-religious fellow student doesn't have, right? You are called to honor God. He's given you this gift. You're treating God with contempt if you do not cultivate your mind. So cu cultivate your, your, your intellect and see where that takes you. Uh, different interests for different people. Not everyone has to study evolutionary theory, cosmology, that sort of thing. But pursue knowledge. Cultivate your mind. Right? Practice good intellectual habits. Uh, finally, I'm, I'm trying to think about how to, how to put this nice, nicely, but um, <laughs> uh, just shut up about things you don't understand. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Saint, the, the, the church father, the church father, St. Augustine, bishop of the church, one of the most important church fathers in, in Christian history, said 1,600 years ago that uh, it is disgraceful for Christians to say ignorant, foolish things about the natural world, he was talking about the science of his day, to people who happen to know something about the relevant science. Because when they do so, right, when you do that, then you, you, they naturally come to suspect, dismiss the truth of what you're telling them, right? Uh, and so just stop that. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. All right, well, I have a similar question uh, for uh, Tom and John. Do you have a, a brief warning for those who have a non-theist perspective? Yeah, shall I? Be yeah, go ahead. Okay. So there were, there were two things, I think, that, that are important for a non-theist Wait. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For a non-theist. So uh, one is that you know um, science is a very powerful tool for um, understanding the world, but it's it is just that it's a tool, and um, people have over the course of of the history of science used science for evil. So it's not the case that that just using logic and the mechanisms of science that you're um, inoculating yourself or ourselves against uh, horrible evil. Um, so that's one important thing, to keep in mind that there has to be some, I think, grounding in um, what is right and what is moral. I, I just don't think that has to come from the Bible or from a, a book. Um, I think it can come from an understanding of of uh, the social environment and from your peers and from inside of you. Uh, but the other point I was going to make too is that, um, you know, these people are not your enemies. Um, they are, you know, powerful allies in, in the drive that I think we all hope to have, which is to, you know, reduce suffering and, and pain in the world. And, and, uh, and I think that that they're, you know, thinking of them as the enemy is the wrong way to approach the, the whole question. So those are the two major things I would. Mm. Okay, I'm in the awkward position <laughs> of talking to the uh, non-theists being a theist. I, I feel like I'm chastising. Uh, I, I think what I know from, this, this won't apply to all non-theists, but it may apply to some. Uh, I, I know that a lot of harm has been done by people claiming to be Christians, and uh, I, I'm really sorry for that, and I think that's horrible, and it should always be pointed out. And uh, many of the people that I know have been deeply hurt by people claiming to be Christians. I know a, a guy who was, a friend of mine, who was raped repeatedly by a priest. Uh, I would just say, please talk to these people, whoever they are, uh, try to communicate to them what they've done. They need to be held accountable. They need to be told what has happened. And if you, this is the daring part, if you want to really be angry and get, get it out, I would even challenge you to uh, get angry with God and yell at him, scream at him. Some of the Psalms are about that. Psalm 139, you can go look at that. It's about what happened when the Babylonians invaded Judah and how upset they were. And they even say, you know, people are just venting, saying, you know, happy is the person who dashes your babies on the rocks. Uh, and kills them. It, it's, it's not a command. It's not something that is said to be done. We should do this. It is rather an example of someone venting things and getting it out. And I would say there's a lot of harm that's been done, and Christianity needs to, needs to own up to it. So, but please help us. Uh, if we're really Christians, we'll say we're sorry, and we'll change. So. 
Well, the, the next question that I have really follows up on what the two of you just said, and, and it's a big question, but I need a small answer to it, <laughs> uh, which is how, from your own perspective now, how do you deal with questions of injustice, suffering, death? Do you, does your perspective have a solution for those, or how have you personally dealt with them? And if you can do that in about a minute or so each. <laughs> Whoever wants to start. Yeah, so, all right. Uh, as a Christian, I mean, the, the question for us is, you know, ultimately, some people, most, probably not most people in this room, have suffered the, to the horrible degree that a lot of people around the globe and in human history have suffered. Uh, and many people's lives are just cut tragically short and horrifically. Um, is that suffering, is that possible that that be redeemed, right? And it strikes me that if I were a non-religious person, I'd be deeply perplexed. It would be very difficult for me to be a deeply morally engaged person in the following sense without becoming cynical. Because when I look at human history, I would say the vast majority of people, their suffering is not redeemed. They, they were dealt a really crappy hand in life, and that's it for them, right? Uh, Christianity offers the hope that there can be redemption, right? And we look to Jesus always as Christians for our example, and Jesus suffered and died on our behalf, right? And we look to him, so at least this, our suffering, I can identify with Jesus in my suffering. Yeah, but maybe someone who's not a Christian can't I link their suffering to the suffering of Jesus, but maybe one day they can, right? I, I know sometimes people say, look, you know, the horrible brutality that some people have suffered, that's not redeemable, ever, right? But I, all I want to say is your God is too small if you think that. Yeah, we can't fix that kind of horrible suffering. No matter, psychologists, we can't, we can't fix some people to get so mess, messed up by horrific things they suffer. But an omnipotent God can. He can redeem suffering uh, and ultimately cause a human being to emerge. It's going to have to be post-mortem, but that's part of the package with Christianity. Uh, so in one minute, that's what I'd say. John or Colin? So, I mean, the question was what to do about suffering. Or how, how do you explain do I, it? Is there a yeah. solution? How do you process it? Right. So, I mean, I want to say two things. I think those who are not members of some faith community have a disadvantage because the last thing we want to do is sort of become part of another groupthink cluster. But Tim was right when he said earlier that religion has this power to unify people towards some, some cause. So when we look at charitable work, the good things that religion do, uh, I think the religious traditions, the religious organizations have something of an advantage there. Now, there are steps that people are taking to try to provide um, uh, non-religious alternatives to the standard charities, and I think that those of us who are committed to improving social justice and so on, that's, um, that's a very uh, important thing that we should be trying to enhance and develop even further. I think the, the issue of the hope and the idea that by accepting some piece of doctrine, even the sinner may be redeemed and, uh, and, and live forever, and that Jesus suffered. I, I mean, I see these as elements of Christianity that have actually done enormous harm. I think the anti-Semitism that arose in Europe is very much part of the Christian tradition. The Holocaust is a consequence of that tradition. And I think these kinds of doctrinaire statements about what it takes to have a particular kind of belief in order to get to have the hope that is promised here is enormously destructive. Um, and I think we need to fight. I, I realize there are well-intentioned people on the Christian side who absolutely abhor what their tradition has delivered in this respect, but I don't think talking about redemption because you've accepted some particular piece of doctrine is at all the solution to this. John? Well, first of all, I'd like to go out for a beer with you and talk about whether <laughs> anti-Semitism was yeah. generated by Christianity. I think Hitler was not primarily a religious guy. No, no, but anti-Semitism way predates Hitler. Way well, predates him. I, like I said, let's, yeah. let's go out yeah. and let's talk about yeah. that. And, and <laughs> people have been killing each other. Let's leave God out of the picture. Tribes run around and kill each other all the time. This is not caused by religion. This is a human thing. Okay, now, let me get to my point. Uh, I think, how do I make sense of suffering? I say, yeah, it's a, it's a horrible problem. It's one of the greatest problems. How do you think about God when there's evil in the world? 
Uh, I don't know the answer. Uh, I can think about it in very small, simple ways. Uh, you know, maybe let's say I was out in the woods and a snake bit my daughter in the wrist and who knows, I had no anti-venom and I'd have to chop off her hand so that the venom wouldn't go all the way into her body and kill her. I'd chop off her hand. That sounds like horrific, right? But yet there might be a good intention behind it. Uh, perhaps there are things that I can't understand. What I do know is that God didn't dodge the problem of evil. He became a human being. He let people drive nails into his hands. He let people falsely accuse him. He let people spit on him and all this other stuff. So if there is a God and he has thrown himself right into it, there's hardly been anybody more unjustly accused or more poorly treated than him. He didn't dodge it. I can't explain it. I don't think anyone can explain it. But I can trust that if there is someone who is showing me good in other ways, that he might have reasons that I can't currently understand. And certainly, the problem of evil is not limited to theistic views. The problem of evil, if you're going to complain about evil, you have to say what's good and what's, what's not good. And you have to develop a standard that applies to everything. And that standard you can't get by science. You have to say, this is what ought to be. Why isn't it that way? That, that's anger toward what ought to be. Uh, that, that almost points toward a God. It's like you can't even be mad about it unless you believe there ought to be a certain way things should be, I think. Tom? Well, I just would say personally, I, I can't, I, I would not want a, a God that I believed in to allow uh, the suffering that I see happening. So, I mean, I just find it very difficult to get beyond that point, and I don't, I don't see, you know, um, the comments that you guys have made respectfully. I don't, I don't, they don't, they don't resonate with me. Sure. And I would say, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, uh, conflict is inevitable, and uh, there's going to be conflict over resources, and there's conflict over um, all sorts of aspects of of life. And, you know, I think that you know the explanation of why misery exists is because it's built into the whole system of evolution by natural selection, at least from my perspective. Um, now, that's not to say that we can't try and shouldn't try to minimize pain and suffering, uh, but I think that it is inevitable, and, and the most we can hope for is to try to better understand, through science, um, the, as I think you would agree, uh, sure. yeah. you know, better understand um, how pain and suffering occur, when they occur, and what kinds of you know, social systems and social organizations um, minimize the, the pain and suffering in the world. I have just one more question for the four of you, and then we'll have some questions from students, so if you've had a chance to, to text or, or tweet. Uh, and, and again, just about one minute answer on this. Is there just kind of one question that you kind of personally are struggling with that your own worldview doesn't answer? And maybe we can start with you, Tom, and go in reverse order. Okay, well, so doesn't answer, I doesn't or answer right now. Or that you're troubled okay. by. So I, I, I have this belief, my belief is that, that science will provide an answer to the, the question that I'm about to say, which is, you know, how do you get, I, th I think it's truly fascinating how you could get from, um, you know, the action of neurons, say, to um, the beliefs and feelings that I have now and the experience that I have. Um, so I believe as a material scientist that that all of my experience is, is basically some sort of material movement of uh, atoms and so forth and built up into neurons. And, but how exactly that works to me is just tremendously a, a difficult question and, and a fascinating question. But again, I, I think that science will provide us increasingly a, a way to get towards that question. And then also the, the question that we started with about the, uh, you know, the origin, why are the constants the way they are? Um, again, I don't think that we have to assume a God uh, in order to explain that. It might be that that's the only explanation we have after we try all the possible um, material explanations that we can think of. But, um, but that's another fundamental question. You know, where, where did it all come from? Um, and so, again, it's not that I think these things can't be answered, but they haven't yet been. I think one of the things I'm constantly thinking about is, uh, you know, what parts of Scripture should I take metaphorically and what parts should I take literally? 
Um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, that there are clearly some metaphors in the Bible. I don't know. Uh, I, I do believe Jesus rose from the dead. I think if you don't believe that, you, you can hardly be a Christian. But I would say other things are you know, somewhat up for grab. Like you were talking about earlier, uh, Augustine said that it's not really clear that you have to take Genesis literally. Uh, that's something that I'm working through, uh, other types of things. Uh, I think I'm constantly trying to think about that. Uh, and I don't know exactly where to draw the line on all those issues. So. I think I'm still struggling with the question of why John had better jokes in his opening <laughs> statement. <laughs> we need to get him in the scanner and probe this, right? <laughs> um, no, for me, the, the biggest uh, thing that I struggle with is I have so many things I'd like to explain and so much confidence that by pursuing the methods that I see my colleagues pursuing, that there will be answers to some of the questions that we find mysterious in the not so distant future. And yet biology has, for some reason, determined that my cells will eventually disintegrate and I won't know those answers. And that's just frustrating, but <laughs> it's also enormously exciting to be part of that process of discovery. Uh, well, I, I share that, that very frustration, but um, since I'm the, the religious panelist, um, I want to focus on the religious aspect of, of my, my worldview. And I guess what most frustrates me is the fragmentary nature of what I, we, we Christians believe God has revealed in the, in the Bible about what awaits us, and in particular about the route that we get there. You know, if you think about human beings, especially uh, going back in, in human history, uh, the circumstances of their lives are just all over the map, right? Some people die in utero, right? Some people die of old age. Uh, in terms of cognitive maturity, right? There are infants born with some people who die as infants, some who are severely mentally disabled, some who end up with dementia. So the trajectory of their life, that from a Christian standpoint we want to see, actually takes this, this nosedive at the end of their lives. And finally, just you know, the notion of spiritual maturity that we have, uh, myself included, uh, a lot of us, are, we don't get very far um, along that path, and, and yet we die. So then what? Uh, well, this, this kind of thing, this kind of question, the, the seeming kind of abruptness of death has uh, led Christian thinkers to speculate over the centuries um, and try to fill in the gaps. And the frustrating thing is we have no data. We're like scientists. We're not given further data. So all we can do is just sort of speculate about it, uh, and we don't seem to get very far. It's, it's, it's a theological corollary, you might say, that there has to be some further process post-mortem, uh, and yet we, we, we just have nothing to go on in terms of understanding what it would be like. So this, you know, I've been emphasizing theory, you know, unifying. This is where the kind of theory confirmation side of me, the philosopher who likes to have the big picture where it all hangs together, has to simply give way uh, to, um, my, to, to recognize that I'm not going to get to know and I just have to humbly trust God um, that this will be worked out in the end. Um, it frustrates the, the heck out of the philosopher in me, uh, but my faith also teaches me that it's a good thing for me. All right, thank you. Uh, so at this point, we'll have some students who have been uh, um, selected and organized read some of the questions that you've texted or tweeted right. in. Uh, and so who's ever ready to, to start with right. that? Uh. Hi, my name is Nodette. I'm a senior here at IU and I study psychology. The question I have from an audience member for you is, if there is no God, what are the implications of that for our purpose in life? That's a question for me and Tom. So um, the implication is you have to make your own purpose. You have to find your own value. And that's very scary to some people. They would much rather have somebody else tell them what the purpose is. But I actually think it's an, an enormously serious challenge that uh, again, is one of those things that one can actually take pride in trying to identify what it is about us that makes certain things have purpose and others not. I know I'm not going to build the world's greatest matchstick collection. That is not <laughs> a purpose that I can latch on to, and I think I could probably give a good scientific explanation of why it's not a purpose that I could latch on to. But I do think as human beings, we are naturally inquisitive creatures. We do seek the kind of unification and simplicity that 
Tim has uh, mentioned, but we also have to recognize that those, those uh, tr tendencies are useful in some circumstances, but may not actually lead us to the truth. The truth is very, very complicated. Simple stories help us deal with that truth, but they are, in the end, just simple stories. And so I think uh, you know, the purpose comes from understanding that we are limited in our understanding, but have the means collectively to improve that. Add anything to that? Yeah, I, I like that. I mean, I, I would also say, just at a personal level, that um, you know, I think the purpose for me in my life is to try to maximize the health and happiness of the people that I love, which includes my my children, my family, and and my friends, um, and then expanding out from there. Um, so uh, that seems to me a, a very time-consuming <laughs> uh, purpose. Um, and I also uh, agree, I think, with, the, with what Colin was saying, you know, that having somebody else tell me what the purpose is doesn't feel right, um, unless they can, they can prove that that purpose is correct, and, and that's not possible. It's a belief that you, that you have, um, so. Okay. Do we have another question? Hi, I'm Katie, and I'm a senior studying nonprofit management. And my question for you guys is, how can humans have a unified morality without a specific moral lawgiver? Okay, sounds like it's for the two of you again. What was it again? How can we have a specific morality without having a lawgiver? Right? Um, I mean, this is the old problem from that predates Christianity of, are things good because God tells us they are, or does God tell us that they, things are good because they're good. And it's even accepted in much Christian theology that the second answer has to be the right one. That is, if your God commanded you to kill babies for no reason other than your own enjoyment, that would not be a good God. So, so the lawgiver does not get to choose what laws to give and ipso facto make those things good. So we're again thrown back on our own intellect or on our own reasoning to try to understand why, if you think there's a lawgiver who gave the laws of morality that there are, why those were the laws that that intellect chose. And our only tool for doing that is our own intellect. We can work it out. Just because you found it written down somewhere doesn't make it right. Um, we have to figure out whether what was written down is in fact consistent with an appropriate evaluation of the, uh, the principles by which we choose not to arbitrarily treat people in certain ways. So I think in the end, we're, we're, we have to uh, do exactly what the atheist has to do, even if you're a theist. You have to evaluate what you've been told is the law using the very same principles that the atheist has available to address exactly the same questions. Can we jump in? Sure, you can jump in. Okay, so here's my question for both you guys. Uh, is it okay for anybody to come up with any set of laws that they construct on their own? So you, you might differ and you might differ, or will they all converge to the same set of good laws? So that's a question that philosophers have wrestled with, and you know, Kant argued that in the end, the, the only rational principle on which to determine answers to this question is one which uh, gives you principles which are universally generalizable. So, so uh, this is the so-called categorical imperative, and it would be a rather long lecture to get into all the things that might mean. But, but Kant thought there was this rational principle of generalizability that any moral precept had to adhere to. Alternatively, you've got other views in philosophy, such as utilitarian, which just takes for granted that pain and other forms of suffering are a bad thing and that they're better off removed. And so we should act in a way that minimizes the amount of that. These are both principles one can come to without any particular theological underpinning for those. Well, then it, why don't you go? Okay. Go ahead. Uh, you know, it seems to me what the question is getting at is the question of where in the kind of basement of reality, where, where is moral value, where is moral obligation? rooted in, in reality, right? Uh, you can be an atheist and think, and just say, you know what, they're just primitive, objective, moral facts. 
right? They're, they're there, and we just have to trust that our own, you know, thinking and, and going through the process Colin's talking about is going to help us reliably track those facts, right? You could say that, but, you know, th these are really weird kinds of things, these, these platonic facts about the good, right? Theism says uh, uh, that at the foundation of reality is a personal reality, right? It's not the impersonal world of physics. Deeper than physics is God who sustains all things. It's not just, God, by the way, it's not just, you know, some being, uh, some, some guy who's got a lot of power and we have to kind of pay, pay uh, attention because he might smite us. God is, God is the very source of everything on a theistic view. He underlies that, that this universe would not continue to be if God did not continue to will it into being, right? So he's the very source of reality. He's the very source of us. And the theist says in response to Plato's alleged difficult uh, dilemma, right? Uh, God's very nature is where morality comes from. God, God, God is, uh, um, it, it, it's not just God arbitrarily deciding what's good. It, it's a reflection of God's intrinsic moral character. That is the source of, of morality. It's the source of everything on a theistic picture. Did you want to check? Um, yeah, well, I would just say that I think that the, our morality comes from uh, the evolutionary process. So I, I don't find it, um, surprising and I, I, I feel like um, it, it it's clear that there are people that are uh, immoral and um, or amoral or don't understand morality and and we um, various societies put them in jail or otherwise deal with them in various ways sometimes put them to death if if they've done heinous crimes um, so it's not the case, I would argue, from my perspective, that you know, the evolutionary process is going to produce everyone who feels exactly the same way, has the same sort of moral foundation. But it's pretty clear that we, we uh, majority of people have uh, a, a sort of a common ground about what, what we feel is, is moral and ethical. And so for me, it comes from both the sort of biological evolutionary story um, so people have explained, for example, um, evolution of altruism and, and so forth uh, from an evolutionary perspective. And that, in certain contexts, you can show is, in fact, adaptive and beneficial. And so having a sort of internal feeling that I should be good to, to friends and to my children and so forth, um, that has an evolutionary explanation. Um, but also there's the sort of cultural evolutionary story. So, you know, we, the, the history of this country has been, been one in which um, early on morality based on the Bible was used to justify slavery, for example. And so we've evolved um, culturally to un have a, a, a different, hopefully better understanding of what the, the Bible was saying to us. Um, so I think both of these sorts of, both the biological evolutionary story and the sort of cultural evolutionary story you know, we're all, it's all experiments on how to maximize happiness of the most number of people, it seems to me, and different cultures and different groups um, and different societies are constantly uh, playing around with different types of, of rule systems to see what, what does work the best and what minimizes the likelihood of a Hitler or uh, some other crazy person. Uh, so. Great, thanks. Do we have another question? My name is Dane Kirchhoff Foster. I'm a junior majoring in political science and philosophy. And we have what is unfortunately the last student question because of all the robust discussion. We do not have time for the one planned. Anyway, <laughs> moving on to the question. Uh, with your worldview, how do you explain the ideas of love and beauty? With whose worldview? With I guess own. each of us. How do you explain? Oh, you had a, oh I see. For each of us, the love question and for all beauty? of us. Right, right. Sure. Right. Who wants to go first? Pick someone. You? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, beauty, let me try to handle that first. Uh, in physics, uh, if equations are beautiful, we think they must be right. Uh, I remember when I was an undergrad and I was looking at uh, Maxwell's equations and I realized, oh wow, you know, the electric field lines go out straight and the magnetic field lines curve and, and these interact. A change in this one brings a change in that one. And, and now the constants, if you put them together in the right way, you get the speed of light. Oh, all electricity and magnetism can be explained by this. And I'm a geek. I wept when I saw that. Okay, so 
It was beautiful. It was really beautiful. And I, this kind of gets back to the discussion that we were talking about earlier with the constants and everything, which is it doesn't actually have to be that way, right? It could have been that to explain all of electricity and magnetism, we had a really long table of facts. And they weren't concise, and you know, you just had to say, oh, well, that's fact number 57396. That, that would not be beautiful. And I think one of the things that almost everyone says, Doug Hofstetter gave a colloquium in physics recently, and he said that uh, what motivates him is his father's vision which was that the universe has always been beautiful. And uh, I think that I naturally ask, why is that? Why does it have to be that way? Because it might have been otherwise. Uh, I could create a computer world where things aren't beautiful, where the equations are clunky and bad. So I think it's a clue. I think in my worldview, it, it suggests that there's somebody who put those things together. Tom? Well, uh, not to beat a dead horse, but um, you know, again, I think that we have evolved to uh, care about certain things more than other things. Uh, when we're hungry, uh, when we're low on nutrients, we feel hungry, and then we get great pleasure out of uh, fulfilling uh, that that need. So, um, you know, I, to me, beauty comes from the evolutionary process that has ensured we're we're all, from my perspective the descendants of a long line of people who made certain choices or, or felt certain ways, um, mostly because of their uh, biology, and, and individuals who, say, didn't feel hungry uh, are not the individuals that ended up being us. So for me, beauty comes from, ultimately derives from the evolutionary process, and that we can understand beauty from that context. Do you want to? Yeah, uh, so let, let me talk about love and kind of connect to what I uh, said at the end of my opening remarks. Um, uh, you know, the, the Christian doctrine of the Trinity is often a, uh, a subject uh, that um, enlightened folk uh, want to criticize because we don't really understand it. And I think that's true. We don't really fully grasp the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, but to me, one of the reasons uh, that, I, that I said that uh, Christian theism is the most plausible theism going is precisely the doctrine of the Trinity. Because the Christian doctrine of the Trinity says love is built into the foundation of reality. God is three persons somehow interpenetrating one another to form just one united God. God doesn't, God doesn't create out of a need for us, right? Even if God had created nothing at all, love would have been the foundational reality that there is. Uh, and so, so I think that's, that, that's an argument in favor because uh, in favor of Christianity because we can find the value of love, the objective value of love, right at the foundations of reality. Colin, do you have thoughts on love? All the time. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I'm going to take a, what will seem initially to be a kind of pedestrian physiological view of this. So we know that when uh, women give birth to children, there's a massive rush of oxytocin, which causes the most intense feelings of attachment to this child. Um, and we know that we can actually, as scientists, manipulate oxytocin levels. And we find that it plays a role in all sorts of personal and even interspecies with your dog sorts of reactions, right? Why you love your dog. Um, we can also understand well why this kind of intense bonding is extremely important for creatures that occupy certain kinds of environmental niches. And we can look at closely related species of vole and find out that the ones who are monogamous and maintain lifelong uh, relationships have you know, 10 times as much oxytocin as other closely related species which don't have this kind of pair bonding system. So we can understand all of the feelings and the rationale behind those feelings and why in certain kinds of selective histories it would favor the kind of lifelong partnerships versus more transient partnerships. All of that is understandable. It doesn't make it any less wondrous, wondrous or fun to experience, right? That's, I think, the, the most important thing to realize here. Having that understanding doesn't make it go away. <laughs> it, it doesn't make it any uh, um, less valuable to you as you experience the world. And it doesn't need some other story underpinning it as uh, sort of it being the core thing that underlies everything 
it's just a darn good thing in its own right. Great, thank you. Thank you.